The daily activities of modern Americans are nonetheless fast-paced. Every day we must wake up early and be on our way to work in the blink of an eye. However, humans require fuel in order to perform everyday tasks. A person losing focus and motivation in the heat of a workday is daunting and stressful. One solution to this matter comes in the form of a beverage known as coffee. Coffee is a warm beverage made from the infusion of hot water through roasted coffee grounds. These coffee grounds come from seeds found within red berries, almost resembling cherries, of the coffea plant. Coffee comes in a variety of flavors and aromas that are characterized by how fine the grounds are, the location the coffee plants were grown, and the grade at which they were roasted. These coffee styles can be purchased from coffee shops and other distributors that are found by the hundreds across the United States and the rest of the world. The popularity of coffee has remained resilient in American and world cultures even from its humble beginnings. The food lore of where and when coffee and its culinary abilities were first discovered are composed of legends and folklore. One legend points to Haji Omer as the first discoverer of coffee's properties after being driven out of Mocha and roasting the berries near his hiding place. However, historians such as Nigiru Nizegu agree that Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, is the original home of coffee. Before the 15th century, coffee gained popularity in Ethiopian cultures because of its energizing properties such as caffeine. Prominent public figures like monks consume different forms of coffee on a regular basis to stay focused during long prayer sessions. The culinary use of coffee throughout the area began to become a standard ingredient much like flour. As its popularity grew in Ethiopia, coffee was soon introduced into the Middle East by Sudanese and Ethiopian pilgrims that were traveling to Mecca, a holy city in the Islamic religion. Upon arriving to Mecca, these travelers' consumption of coffee to stay energized through prayer times had attracted the interest of Arabic peoples. Traders in Mecca took the coffee beans back to their hometowns, causing the Arabian Peninsula to be taken away by this new fragrant beverage. During the 1400s, the popularity of coffee grew throughout the Arabian Peninsula stemming from Greater Yemen. This area was home to the mass imports of coffee beans and plants from East Africa. The growing surplus allowed coffee houses to emerge as places of conversation, political debates, and general social interaction. The Ethiopian method of brewing coffee was altered by coffee houses and offered an assortment of house blends for the public to choose from. Coffee also found its way into Arabic households to be consumed daily by working class men. With such a growing demand, it became more of a commodity than a trendy beverage. With African coffee imports being too expensive, coffee farming began to sweep across the Arabian Peninsula. According to Saleh Zemeke, the expansion of farms extended the coffee plant eventually to all of the Muslim world via travelers, pilgrims, and traders, reaching Mecca and Turkey sometime in the late 15th century. Despite its popularity, coffee faced some reproof by religious and state authorities in the Middle East as its coffee houses provide recluse for liberal interpretations of Islam. The coffee industry proved to be a major stimulus to the economy of nations in the Arabian Peninsula. In the continued pursuit of preserving the Arabic monopoly that has been created, traders often made export beans infertile by parching or boiling them before exporting them to Europe. Eventually in the 16th century, when the Arabic Peninsula became ransacked by the Ottoman Empire, the dispersion of coffee reached even further beyond the Middle East to the empire's capital Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. Coffee was dispersed throughout the entire empire by 1543 after gaining the approval of Sultan Suleiman in Constantinople. After reaching the port city of Constantinople, coffee was granted access to nations that bordered the northeastern Mediterranean Sea. Despite the door finally being opened to Europe, the efforts in monopolizing coffee by the Ottomans had to be crossed by European traders in order for its expansion into the rest of Europe. The Venetians, for example, were the first ones to gain access to coffee through trade, but according to Anthony Wilde, the Turks' jealousy guarded their monopoly over the tree's cultivation in Yemen. As aforementioned, the Ottomans' monopoly over coffee was not just fueled by economic greed. In fact, the relationship the Ottoman Empire had with European nations at the time did not really have a good track record. The Republic of Venice, in particular, had various Mediterranean territories that were always under siege by the Ottomans. With the progression of coffee being introduced into Western European lands and the ill-fated attitude coming from the Turks, who still remain the sole suppliers of the commodity, the coffee trade began to resemble much more of a black market in the eyes of the Turks. Conversely, the legality of this market was not questioned at all by the Venetians. In fact, the Venetians were benefiting from this. 
Venetian coffee houses and overall coffee trade granted a similar positive stimulus to the economy that was found in the Arabic Peninsula. The small territory of Venice was much like Constantinople in terms of cultural diffusion through trade. Their ports served as Europe's gateway into the Islamic world. Fortunately for the Europeans, the supply of coffee from the Arabic Peninsula was coinciding with the growth of coffee houses. Nations like France saw their first coffee houses opening up in coastal cities like Marseille in 1671. Coastal cities were not the only ones that succumbed to coffee's hypnotic craze. The supply of coffee was able to reach northwestern Europe and allowed nations like Britain to contain coffee houses by the late 1650s. Different brewing styles continued to develop as mixtures of cream, milk, and sugar became the standard additives to coffee that we have come to know and love today. Amongst all of this hype over coffee, opposition remained present from authority figures who despised the free-thinking atmosphere coffee shops offered to its patrons. Church officials at first had condemned the drink, but upon review by Pope Clement VIII, they deemed coffee as a holy drink, serving as an alternative to substances that are deemed sinful like alcohol. Others despise the drink still due to its hindrance to the alcohol industry. Including various factions of opposition, coffee's presence in Europe began to face even more difficulties shortly after its introduction. Once coffee had reached Europe, whose kingdoms were already set in the practice of globalization, its popularity in a continent that does not have the optimal climate for its farming demanded a method of outsourcing that would not be damaged by the costs of Middle Eastern imports. Because of this, transoceanic conglomerates, such as the Dutch East India Trading Company, transported fertile coffee seeds to Dutch-owned colonies found in the South Pacific, like Java. Other European nations began to follow suit with England outsourcing its crops to Jamaica and France to Martinique by 1728. These colonies are found close to the equator and have very warm climates that are perfect for coffee cultivation. South and Central American colonies began housing some of the largest coffee plantations in the world, thus revoking the coffee monopoly completely from the Ottoman Empire. Spreading coffee plants to various parts of the Caribbean and South American colonies became more of a secretive feat as the competition began to weigh in over this valuable cash crop. Traders and potential plantation owners began to smuggle seeds and saplings from different sources to start their own plantations. However, the common labor force for coffee cultivation in the Americas came from African slaves. The demand for coffee from these plantations came from colonial establishments in the New World and European nations that had either sponsored or are the homes of these plantation owners. Following suit to Europe, coffee houses began to sprout up in the northeastern part of North America, whose decor much resembled the ones at home. The first coffee house in North America opened in 1696 in New York formerly known as New Amsterdam, about 20 years before it was under new management by England. Unfortunately for colonists residing in this area, the English enforced different taxation laws that led up to the famous Tea Act of 1773. The intent was to relieve the debt that had built up within the East India Company, whose tea surpluses, including coffee and other surpluses, were oversaturated in Europe. This tax also played a role in Britain paying off war debts that had emulated from the Seven Years' War, a war that was primarily waged over obtaining colonial land by different belligerents. The continuing black market of coffee and tea throughout the American colonies, away from British influence, had their prices undercut by the East India Company after the Tea Act's passing. This would allow the company not only to pay off its dues to Parliament, but it enforced the notion that the colonies were under parliamentary control and can be taxed. The American reception to these laws was sequentially not good. With a continuation of unscrupulous tax reform coming from the Crown, colonists, naturally to say the least, had rebelled. The onslaught of taxes coming from the East India Company's newfound tea monopoly instigated what is now known today as the Boston Tea Party. Organized by some of the founding fathers, the American rebels had dumped almost an entire shipment of British tea into the Boston Harbor. The meetings before this famous act had taken place in what is known as Boston's Green Dragon, a coffeehouse tavern from 1697 to 1832. Rebellions such as this had inspired what is known as the American Revolution, a war that ousted British control from the American colonies, allowing the creation of the United States of America.
after the American Revolution, tea surpluses in the new states were at an all-time low due to Britain being the main supplier. Tea had become ousted by the public as it gave the inclination of loyalty to the crown. Because of this and America's close proximity to the world's leading coffee growers in South America, coffee remained a culturally relevant drink over tea. Coffee had also remained popular due to its rebuttal against alcoholic drinks by Christian officials, leaving it as an energizing alternative. In fact, coffee had become identified as a symbolic drink of American culture. With westward expansion at play in the 19th century, coffee's long journey from Africa would continue throughout the United States. As the expansion of peoples into the western area of the United States had occurred, coffee remained a popular stimulant used every morning to wake up for such long journeys. Coffee houses had spread up in towns across the United States states that would be fought over in the American Civil War. In this ideological war, the United States had become split into two factions known as the Union in the North and the Confederacy in the South. Soldiers on the Union side had coffee contained in their daily meal rations despite southern ports, the primary import location of coffee, being sanctioned from the Confederacy by the Union government. Coffee was granted access into the North through developing positive trade relationships with countries such as Brazil shortly after they had gained independence from Portugal in 1822. Coffee's popularity among soldiers had resembled the drinking activities of alcohol, whereas the quantity one drank would determine one's manliness. Even with an entire nation divided, coffee's popularity remained resilient on both sides. The Confederacy, who had little to no access to coffee, had embraced it once more after the war's passing and being assimilated back into the Union. America's thirst for coffee had continued after the Civil War as coffee houses continued to open up throughout the country. The beverage had never lost its popularity amongst the nation's presidents after the war, with Theodore Roosevelt being known to consume bathtub-sized amounts of coffee. New methods of industrialization and food storage allowed pre-made coffee grounds to be distributed to homes from the Atlantic to the Pacific in metal cans. This preservation method allowed coffee to stay fresh for an incredible amount of time. In fact, coffee was able to be preserved long enough for the United States military to take it with them overseas in both world wars. In World War II, United States servicemen were issued what is known as instant coffee. Instant coffee is made from the dehydration of finely ground coffee beans, allowing a much longer time of freshness than what canned coffee would have to offer. When Allied troops were deployed into Italy, the world came into contact with a new type of coffee known as espresso. This newfound brewing style became a heavy influence on the future of the coffee house industry in America. The adoption of this coffee style by the American public primarily came from coffee houses that had been looking for a new manner of serving coffee. One coffee house in particular, known as Starbucks, had adopted this new style after operating as a roaster and retailer of coffee beans located in Seattle's busy Pike Place Market. The company quickly gained steam through the 1990s as their espresso-based drinks became a huge novelty to the American public. Coffee houses had remained prevalent in American society long before Starbucks had adopted the Italian coffee house concept. With the help of franchising similar to McDonald's, Starbucks and their espresso-style coffee bars gained popularity quickly with over 20,000 stores around the world as of 2015. With this oversaturation of Starbucks stores across the world, the brewing style and the original identification of coffee as an American drink has shifted dramatically. Grassroots movements have developed across the nation over the deindustrialization of coffee due to Starbucks' reputation of serving unnatural and industrial-driven coffee. Granted, the success of Starbucks did lead to duplications of their store styles, such as Delaware's Brouhaha coffee chain. Along with this, coffee has become associated as a culinary art form, where baristas such as Rita Zhang regard its production to be firstly judged by the presentation, then by the taste. The production of coffee from these new houses is often served in the form of foamed or steamed milk, being added to shots of espresso known as lattes, macchiatos, and cappuccinos. These coffee confections are primarily derived from Italian coffee cuisine. Because of the population of these serving styles, true coffee confections and styles are attributed to the Italian nation. This has become a huge problem for the understanding of coffee's authenticity. With such a dense history at play, it is now a common generalization by the American people to pinpoint a serving of coffee's authenticity to a certain group of people. Some point to brews whose beans are from South Africa as being the more proper or authentic types of coffee, keeping in mind that South American nations like Brazil are one of the largest producers of coffee according to the United States Department of Agriculture. 
Coffee and its culinary attributes have shifted over time by various cultures that have adopted it. To conclude that true coffee derives from a single culture's method of brewing or their location discredits centuries of coffee's role in hundreds of cultures. There is no proper manner of brewing coffee, but rather there is a proper manner of enjoying it. In order to truly enjoy coffee, and most foods in general, you must understand the food lore of it. So come join us next time as we review some more food lore.